Hi, everybody. Uh, it's Dave Gilchrist from Bookmarks Bookshop. Um, tonight we have a very exciting new book that's out. It's called Half Earth Socialism. We have both the authors, uh, Troy Vitesse and Drew Prendergast, here to talk with us. Um, we also have uh, Dominic O'Keefe. There we go who is the Leverhulme Early Career Fellow at the University of Sheffield. And we've just been talking about it. And that's a very big deal indeed <laughs> in the humanities field. Uh, so we're very lucky uh, the, um, to have Dominic uh, tonight. Uh, this book, Half of uh, Socialism, um, I'm sure the authors don't mind if we call it a work in utopian uh, socialism. We were just mentioning uh, people um, like um, 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 Moore and so on in his utopia. Plato we were talking about there. Well, well I wasn't, but they were. Um, uh, but other people have been mentioned in discussions around the book. Uh, the guy called Otto Neurath, who was um, in the Bavarian uh, Soviet in, you know, the Munich uh, in the German Revolution in uh, 1918. And uh, a guy called Edward Wilson, a naturalist who, um, who I believe initiated the concept of half earth socialism. And we're going to talk, the, you know, our authors here and uh, Dominic are going to ta talk about what that means. But there's also, there's, I mean, apart from the, the questions of, of um, how to save the world, really. There's clear, there's clearly wider questions there if we're talking about ideas that come in over a period of time and the whole concept of utopian socialism. Um, many people will be familiar with that, but you will may perhaps think about the ideas of Fourier and, um, you know, seas of lemonade and, uh, and so on. So we can talk, you know, I'm sure our guests tonight will talk about how they may differentiate themselves from that or not. I, I don't know. Um, so really, you didn't come to listen to me. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Dominic, who's going to lead the questioning, and to our two authors, Drew and Troy. Thank you very much. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone in London and elsewhere. Um, no matter what time you're on, I'm actually in California, so it's my morning. Um, great to be here. Thanks to Dave and uh, Bookmarks for having us and for Verso for helping organize this event. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and a real pleasure to be talking about such a thought-provoking, stimulating, exciting, provocative even um, book. And it's amazing to see Verso publishing such kind of ecologically informed radical work. It is, of course, I must say, also amazing to be in a decidedly leftist space where veganism is not something to be argued for, but is in fact one of the presumptive kind of marks or foundations of the entire debate. Um, so we can actually get towards the nitty gritty of veganism rather than establishing whether it's something to even consider. We can go beyond that. I think that's really, really special about this book. And yeah, so, well, let's get started. I, the way I'm thinking about this is that I will um, do kind of back and forth with uh, Troy and Drew, maybe for 40, 45 minutes. We'll see how we do. And um, if if questions come in in that time, um, maybe I'll try and feed them into my, my own um, kind of weaving of a narrative around this book. But then later on, we will open it up um, more deliberately for those questions. Um, I think where I would like to get started um, is to ask you both about your own biographies, your own stories, um, how you came to write this book. Um, so in a sense, a kind of Gramscian inventory of the self. Um, could you could you inventorize yourselves for me? Um, it, it kind of tell tell me where you come from and um, how you came together, right? How you came to put your minds together to work on this book project. Maybe we'll start with uh, Drew. Yeah, thank you Bookmarks for having us. Um, I am an environmental engineering PhD student. I work on the science side. Um, 
I in particular work on um, using satellites and other observations to study the atmosphere. Um, uh, currently trying to figure out uh, real-time maps of emissions of methane, an important greenhouse gas. Um, I met Troy because I read uh, one of his articles in the New Left Review about um, kind of uh, this really nice holistic picture of how we can think about the environmental crisis. So I wrote to Troy thinking we could do some sort of collaboration and then this book sort of emerged. Um, yeah, Troy, I don't know if you, <laughs> you have uh, more to add. Yeah, sure, sure. I think, Drew, I wonder if you should make it clear as well that when you say environmental engineering, it's not that you're trying to like make really good septic tanks or something like that. Like you're doing uh, a lot of modeling and, and AI and uh, climate, you know, uh, you know, astro, you know, not astro, but atmospheric, you know, chemistry and, and physics and all that as well, right? And that, that's your background. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a, like, first of all, I also want to say, I think it's important to talk about the background of um, bookmarks, you know, because I, we were talking about how, you know, how much we like the, the, the shop. And I remember being there a couple of years ago for a, the historical materialist um, conference. And walking in and getting a couple of tea towels by uh, Walter Crane. And Walter Crane is a very beloved uh, socialist artist from about 100 years ago. And I only found out recently that he also was a vegetarian, uh, which is quite cool. Um, and then Dominic, of course, you know, the reason why we asked Dominic to join us is because he uh, is another socialist who cares about animals and, and the broader environment. And um, it would try to, I guess, you know, make a, a space for people to to think about these things together. Because if anything, I find it very bizarre. Maybe we'll talk about this later. Where maybe there's some eco socialists who say they care about climate, but they still don't care about animals, right? And that's like a harder sell for some reason. Um, and and but it's nice to talk about these things. And and even you know, even when we we wrote this book. We told people about it. I think people were surprised that Verse was publishing a book about veganism and, and animals. And it was, uh, people were surprised because this, um, these topics have been hard for the left to discuss for a long time. And we think that things are moving and hopefully you know, this book and also this conversation we're having tonight and many other things that are happening these days are changing that. And this is also one reason why it'd be great if we have a lot of Q&A and uh, to talk to people because you know we, we hear ourselves talk about this book all the time, but we also want to hear from, from the audience. And um, just to say how we got to write this book. So Drew's the scientist and then I'm the historian. And it's not always easy to collaborate across boundaries. I mean, I've done some other collaborations, you know, with scientists before, and it's not <laughs> gone nearly as well. And I think it's it, it was good to work with Drew because he's also a fantastic writer and he's very well read. And he's really like a two cultures kind of guy where he, he knows the sciences, but also cares about the arts. And, you know, just, that, you know, I'm not a, a scientist at all, but as an environmental historian, you're kind of forced to read, you know, some scientific papers or deal a little bit with, with ecology and history of ecology and all that. So we had, and I think like another way we could talk about things together uh, was with socialism, right? I mean, that provided us a common language to, to think about a lot of problems. So, um, you know, and then we also collaborated and we would, uh, take charge of certain chapters, and then we would let the other person be really merciless in their editing, and then eventually it smoothed out to a, a similar style. Uh, you know, it's not always easy, but uh, I'm very happy to work with Drew, and it's, it's I'm very proud of the book, and uh, it's been really fun to collaborate with someone on this, especially over the pandemic, right? So we were feeling very isolated, but we could work together on this project, and the pandemic comes into the book. I mean, I don't think uh, zoonotic disease would have been nearly as important uh, for our conception of, of eco-socialism uh, had it not been for the, for the pandemic. So it was a, a strange co collaboration in a strange time, but uh, it worked out great. And then another thing is also strange is Drew was an undergrad when I met him, actually. So uh, he's just a very precocious, uh, you know, um, scholar and, um, it was it was fun fun to work on it together. And it was fun to get uh, some coffees um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and talk about these things. And realize we wanted to work on this together. It was a risk, but it worked out okay.
Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly what I wanted. Uh, the, the the image of you guys uh, sharing a coffee and hashing out ideas, which would eventually become a book. I mean, that's that's a dream, right? Of co-authorship. Uh, so yeah, that's fabulous. I mean, let's then. I mean, what you've just said, Troy and Drew, has prompted so many things. I mean, we've got the question of of animals and its relation, their relationship to the environmental movement or, or eco socialism. We have uh, the, the question of the book's style, its its tones, its registers, its language, which has clearly, as you said, been um, smoothed out after two individual voices mercilessly ripped into each other's words. Um, but I think, for for sake of uh, getting getting the discussion going, we ought to dive into the the material, the arguments, the ideas that are at work in this book. And basically, the the book starts from um, the position that we are in a bit of a, a perma crisis. Um, we are, we we face um, a situation in which there is uh, wholesale uh, mass extinction. Um, there is climate change, and as you said, Troy, um, pandemics. And just to know, I mean, of of the books and and essays that have clearly been informed um, by the pandemic, um, which we're still living through, of course. Um, this book is substantive in its engagement with um, with zoonotic diseases, rather than just shoehorning them in for the sake of easy narrative. Um, so that's that's a great um, aspect that lays real foundations for the book. So as I said, there's climate change, there's extinction, and there's pandemics. Um, but the book kind of makes the point that 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 what you're doing here is trying to think beyond them. Um, to, to, quote, to quote you guys, you say, the book's purpose is not primarily to criticize the present, but to posit a countervailing positive vision for the future. Um, so what then, if you could, in a nutshell, tell us are uh, your proposed ideas, that, that, that countervailing vision? Um, so what does half Earth socialism propose? What is this argument? Um, I'll start. I'm sure Drew wants to jump in. Um, so I, I study neoliberal environmental thought, uh, and that's what I work on as a historian, and this is a side project. But um, I, I think studying neoliberals for so long has influenced how I think as a socialist because I think, well, neo, like how did neoliberals change the world? And they changed the world because they reinvented their ideology, they organized very well, and uh, they could come up with not only uh, some kind of utopian vision of what, what kind of society they wanted to achieve, but they also had a philosophical shorthand or mechanism that allowed them to diagnose problems and create solutions. So. All this comes together, you know, plus a lot of money from, you know, evil conservative foundations and so forth, uh, allows them to uh, create ideas and, and, get, and get them out and then convince people. And at some level, their critique of socialism is not a bad one. I mean, the information problem about, uh, about planning an economy is a serious issue. Um, and then their solutions, I think, have a seductive quality to them. Because if you believe their argument that, uh, markets are the best way to convey dispersed information and therefore everything should be set on a market. If you believe that, then creating more markets is a logical thing to do. And there's, you know, markets can do well at some tasks uh, for sure, but they fail at others. So, I mean, we don't, we don't believe the, the central core truth of neoliberalism, but um, I think really engaging with their work for several years has given me given me an appreciation of uh, how does how does one work as a political you know, intellectual and also organizer and these are tasks that I believe the left has not done very well and not just the left but also uh, the animal rights movement or um, you know the conservationist movement or the environmentalist movement they've not engaged in this kind of uh, self-critique, a philosophical self-critique, as in like, what are their assumptions and how do they see the world and what are their possible solutions? And they just, they ignore these problems and then they don't engage in problems of organization. So, and 
And if the neoliberals believe that uh, markets are the best way to convey information and the world is ultimately unknowable except through markets, um, then you create markets. That's what they say. And then we say that um, it's best to solve certain problems by seeing them uh, as part of a whole. So you want to make the economy as visible as possible and be able to control that economy within certain environmental limits that you have decided upon through, through science, but also through uh, uh, democratic you know, deliberation. And, um, and then the question becomes, how do you, you know, set these parameters and how do you plan an economy without markets? So this, this is our retort to neoliberalism is saying like, okay, once we have those two principles in place, then we can start doing other things. And again, people can disagree with us, they can say, uh, we don't want to have veganism or we want to have nuclear power and all that, but we would still uh, think that they should agree with us in terms of total planning um, and, and trying to get away from markets because markets don't allow you to plan in the totality. So that, that's the, the guess of the book. And I'll let Drew uh, finish off this, this part and say why exactly uh, the half earth and, uh, and other arguments we make in the book. Yeah, as, as Troy was saying, the book works on two levels. There's one level that's sort of an argument for, um, uh, we use the word um, borrowed from this thinker named Otto Neurath, um, scientific utopia. And the idea here is that um, this thinker, Otto Neurath, who um, Dave was saying was associated with um, experiments in socialism in, in 1918 uh, in, in Germany, um, he thought that socialist democracy uh, encompassed some sort of debates over um, many possible futures, many possible visions of the future. He argued that um, uh, the future uh, or that the economy was made up of incommensurable things, um, uh, involved ethical choices, uh, choices that involved many different consequences and that those should be taken as a whole. And then maybe several holes are offered and discussed and we can then decide as a society which, which future we want. So it's this idea of several total plans, several scientific utopias and socialist democracies choosing one and, and implementing it together democratically. Um, and so the scientific utopia we're proposing uh, in the book is what we call half-earth socialism. Um, the idea of this is that we think that um, climate change and the biodiversity crisis and then zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19 are um, crises of uh, a broader environmental crisis. And this environmental crisis um, is caused by capitalism. It's caused by um, this expanding uh, market form. Uh, I mean, you, the evidence of this is, is clear, like um, over half of all anthropogenic carbon emissions have come since 1990 when the world market finally reigned supreme. Um, so the um, so uh, we, we argue for um, uh, uh, solving these crises through transition to renewable energy. Uh, we argue that uh, the biodiversity crisis, mass extinction, we're living through the sixth mass extinction in Earth's history. This, this is driven um, by several factors, but one of the principal drivers is uh, land use change, is uh, the fact that um, half the Earth is covered in, um, uh, over half the Earth is covered in agriculture. Um, most of that agricultural land is pasture. Um, and as these habitats are transformed, um, you know, the Amazon is being deforested right now, mostly for pasture land. Um, then that uh, drives animals to extinction. This is where the half earth idea comes in. That idea is from E.O. Wilson, the naturalist, who in the 1960s had this work on biogeography where he finds that there's a, there's a pretty definitive relationship between habitat area and biodiversity. He was studying islands, the bigger the island, the more species on it. And then he makes this link later on that, um, that um, nature preserves can be analogized as islands. Um, and then from this sort of mathematical relationship he works out, he thinks that half the earth should be um, set aside for nature in order to um, allow biodiversity to flourish. And we, we take this idea and uh, argue that this would only work under socialism because for one thing, that's a lot of um, industry to confront, right? Um, and you would need a socialist movement. And the other one is that there are some serious problems with the conservationist movement, which we elaborate in the book. Um, it's to, it has a pretty nasty history, uh, which we go into in detail. Um, uh, but um, and, and that E.O. Wilson does not have the best reputation on the left. But nonetheless, we do believe that this land use uh, 
effect on biodiversity is very real and is undeniable. And we should care about the sixth mass extinction, if only because nature keeps us all alive, right? Like it, these ecosystem services, right? Uh, if nothing else convinces you, the, 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 the life-sustaining aspects uh, should make you care about biodiversity, but we should care about it in itself. So, um, so uh, we, we point out in the book that um, biodiversity is higher in uh, indigenous lands. So the half earth, you know, socialist half earth could involve indigenous sovereignty. It, it doesn't necessarily have to look like conservationists in the past, but we do need to take seriously this challenge. And then the transition to renewable energy, um, we argue should come with energy quotas, um, as in uh, the wealthy parts of the world that consume very large amounts of energy should consume less as we expand energy use to poorer areas of the world. Um, and uh, uh, to avoid, you know, extracting too much from from Earth, mining too much stuff, um, uh, running into land use problems, we should we should limit that. So uh, the half Earth I, idea, um, yeah, Troy. I just want to jump in and make clear: it's not like we're taking these policies and saying, "Well, we like this and we like this." It's really we're just trying to say there's a connection between them, and that connection generally has to do with land area, right? So that we uh, we have to make trade offs. Either we can protect land or use land in some ways, uh, or we can avoid using land by using uh, fossil fuels or uranium and uh, for, for nuclear energy, but we have to choose, right? And there's no like easy future where we have like, you know, super high living standards, like high economic growth and no environmental crisis. You have to choose between them. And socialism is a good way to make those choices and because you can't make those choices on the market. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so, um, you know, as you, the audience here, are making your own uh, scientific utopia or your own alternatives, um, the sort of the method of the book, as Troy was pointing out, is to look at these hard trade offs and, and look at the consequences. So, there's no um, science can help us inform our choices, but um, there's no uh, on high answer for like what is the guaranteed, you know, best uh, place to draw these lines. That's something that has to be deliberated democratically, but that doesn't mean that there are no trade-offs at all. You can't simultaneously want to have no mass extinction and this super high uh, material throughput, um, meat for everyone, uh, that sort of thing. That, that's just not possible. There's there's a material problem there. Um, so we go for this more constrained approach, veganism plus energy quotas and equality, uh, and, um, and argue and try and make a really convincing argument. We hope that this is something that people should adopt but since the book works on two levels, we hope that there will be counter proposals and counter visions that are equally uh, confronting these hard trade offs and, and offering some sort of positive vision of the future that, that hangs together uh, in some sense. Yeah, thank you both. I mean, you write, you write in the book that meeting the needs of nature and humanity is fundamentally a material goal measured in food and carbon molecules and seeing the world in natural units allows us to directly confront trade-offs without the obfuscation of money. And it seems as if there is, going through the book, this sense of, and I, I think go, this takes us back to this idea of scientific utopianism, um, there is a sense of like deeply informed scientific work that's right throughout this book. You only have to glance at the end notes to see the amount of research that goes into almost, you know, almost every sentence in some chapters is endnoted. Um, and then on the other side, this imaginative and political desire. Um, so it's informed by the science and the political um, almost, you know, at one in each sentence go, that, that, that goes through the book. And that's, that's kind of what takes us to uh, trade-offs as well, because there is then this sort of hard-nosed, there will be decisions to make argument that goes through the book. And yet at the same time, you're not prescriptive about those decisions. There are plenty of occasions in the book in which your kind of um, uh, engagement with modeling and planning, in fact, allows you to say, well, things, you know, things, we could do things slightly differently if we were to have the ratio this way then it would mean that some things are lost, other things are gained. If we were to have the ratio that way, then we'd cut off this much land or we'd save this many species. Um, so you're you're quite keen to, to be descriptive 
um, in the futures that you're modeling and mapping out. Um, but what you do, of course, is you model them, right? It's not just imagination. It is it is modeling. It is planning. And yet at the same time, right, um, you talk about unbuilding. Talk about half of socialism as a project of unbuilding. As much as it is a plan, uh, um, a idea of planning, of mapping, of redistribution of land, things that are to do with kind of a construction, you are you're kind of imagining a mode of construction which is deconstructing. So I wonder what you um, what if you could clarify for our listeners what what you mean when you talk about unbuilding in the book as what half of socialism is. Um, so unbuilding is not our term. It came from conversations with a friend, uh, Cameron Hugh, and he suggested it and I liked it and threw it in. But what we're trying to get at is um, we're saying there needs to be some kind of restraint uh, and that restraint comes in many forms. It comes in the form of energy quotas and energy quotas are useful because it makes the transition to uh, renewable energy happen faster. If you try to get 100% renewables at very high levels or growing levels of energy, it's going to be more and more difficult. Um, it also, you know, uh, biofuels and renewable energy take up a lot of land. So if you restrict land use, that even even a country that's fairly densely populated and you know fairly uh, you know industrialized, such as like Germany or Japan or the UK, even they could have large conserved areas and renewable energy. But you can't do that if you have super high levels of, of energy use. So, um, and I think the idea of the half earth, which is expanding the amount of preserved land, uh, and we could also add the ocean as well, um, to a huge percentage of the globe, you know, by increasing it by three or five fold, depending on your estimate of what's being protected right now, would require us to uh, leave you know, those areas to some extent, right? Because you can't have a flourishing ecosystem and have uh, you know, a lot of livestock there at the same time. I mean, it's either one or the other. If you look at, say, the United States, it either you try to rewild the Great Plains and you put bison there, uh, but if you do that, you can't have you know millions and millions of cows. So you can you have one or the other is a choice uh, to be made. And the work of unbuilding is not so easy. I mean, to actually rewild uh, an area is is not obvious. I mean, it's, it's a new science in many ways. Uh, people are experimenting with adding uh, you know, similar herbivores or species if something has gone extinct. Um, they're also experimenting with you know, actually trying to backbreed certain uh, species, for example, trying to get the auroch back uh, into, into Europe. <laughs> the auroch, you know, the auroch is the wild cow, but it went extinct uh, hundreds of years ago. So they actually have tried to bring that back. So there's all these things one, one can do. And I think uh, it's not simply just le abandoning it, but, but trying to you know, remove dams and, and all these other uh, and, and, and change how we eat. Because I think you know, when, when we tell people, you know, we need to give up half the earth in some ways, right? Um, they become really frightened and worried, be like, well, uh, that, you know, I, how do we know we have enough for ourselves? And what we say in the book is, if you uh, give up meat consumption, then suddenly you have a lot of land you can play around with, all right? I mean, uh, the meat industry is not a very big industry in terms of its economic value or even the number of people it employs, but it, it takes up a huge amount of land. It takes up around 40% of all inhabitable land. And um, the amount of land you actually need if you're a vegan is only a tenth as much as an omnivore. So if you, people, you know, if people become vegan, then suddenly we have billions of hectares uh, available, like the size of you know, several Canadas, basically. And then you can have enough space for the half earth and for, um, you know, for rewilding and for your renewable energy systems. And even to have vegan, you know, to have agriculture without fossil fuels. Because there have actually been studies saying, because people will tell you, oh, if we get rid of fertilizers and pesticides and try to get out of, uh, try to get fossil fuels out of agriculture, then you can't feed the world. And they're true. I mean, they're, they're right about that. 
if you want to feed people a lot of meat, right? But if you actually have vegan agriculture, then it's, it's, impo it's possible. Almost all the scenarios that they run, uh, something like 99% or whatever the number was, were, were uh, you know, super low meat or vegetarian or vegan scenarios. So these are the kinds of tasks uh, that we're, we're saying. And the, the I'll say one more thing. Um, and that's basically, what we stress in the book, and this is why we draw on certain thinkers such as the utopian socialists, but also writers such as Ursula Le Guin, where we're saying uh, socialism uh, for so long has been uh, predicated on a vision of total domination of nature, and that is the way we will secure this incredible abundance so people can live, you know, like millionaires and all that. And if you really recognize the scale of the environmental crisis, you have to say that's not possible. It's too dangerous to try to do that. And we have to have a more humble existence, but there's a, a tradition in sci-fi and, and, and utopian thought that is fine with that humble relationship to nature. Because I think, uh, and I think it will still provide a better life um, for everyone. So, and I think the left has been afraid of that kind of uh, approach. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a great point to kind of talk about this strain of leftist um, thought that has developed um, over the past decade in particular, um, the kind of fully automated luxury communism, um, accelerationism, um, the inventing the future argument, um, which I think from, from what the book um, says, um, kind of reproduces a kind of Marxist Prometheanism, um, which which is all about the the kind of domination for human ends of the natural world, um, a kind of humanization of nature, uh, which under capitalism has become a capitalization of nature. This is what you you guys argue in the book. Um, but of course, the the kind of accelerationist answer to that capitalization of nature is the kind of communization of nature in a way through everyone becoming, uh, you know, Having having the having the billionaire lifestyle, right? And this this became quite like a you know it started off as a a, a provocation. Um, it started off as kind of a cheeky provocation from the left, but then has been like actually substantively developed into an entire hypothesis. But one of the tendencies, the 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 ideas in this book, is actually to say mm, we might have to give some things up. We can't all live. As billionaires, it would it it might not work uh, on a finite planet. Um, so, but you know, there might be people who say, "Well, okay, you guys are peddling a kind of eco austerity." Um, what what's your answer to that that critique that would come in from the accelerationist left? Yeah, this is a this is a great question. So I'll, I'll start by elaborating our our arguments around um, this sort of Promethean question, um, and then. Uh, maybe Troy can come in, but in the book we we talk a little bit about um, how uh, there is a strain um, of Marx, particularly uh, earlier Marx, um, very informed by Hegel, that uh, stresses this humanization of nature, uh, which Dominic just said. Hum the humanization of nature is an idea that comes from Hegel, and the idea of Hegel is that humans uh, confront nature and they see something alien to them, and then they kind of mix their labor with nature, transform it to their will, and then um, uh, the forest becomes a garden, the river becomes a canal, and now there's some sort of unity there. We've we've uh, realized our, ourself in, in, in nature. And uh, the end of history comes when the world is, is humanized, when the world, there's no longer a conflict between nature and human. Um, and uh, Marx kind of takes this and runs with it, especially in the, the early era, um, that, uh, that um, sort of to have this world of, um, communist abundance, right? Where you working is sort of an optional thing. Um, you kind of humanize nature and transform it into this, this thing that can provide this abundance. And this is a strain that really comes through in, in the modern acceleration or, or accelerationist argument or uh, fully automated luxury communist arguments. It's, it's, it's drawing on this, this uh, strain of Marx. Um, and we argue that this, this Prometheanism, so we, uh, we call this Prometheanism, um, uh, has problems, right? Because nature actually is very complicated. Um, the way we uh, make the case for planning is that uh, against the neoliberals is by saying that um, uh, the neoliberals say that you have to let markets kind of control the economy because 
who would be so arrogant as to think they could to know something as complicated as the economy? So we must be humble and let the economy, uh, let the market kind of do its magic. Um, uh, and interestingly, they, they, they use a lot of natural metaphors. They use a lot of biological metaphors to talk about the market. But we argue that actually the original nature of the original biology is far more complex than the human invention of uh, of markets. And in fact, we should control our own society such that we can minimize the damage we do to nature because that always comes back to bite you. It's uh, uh, We may think that we can control nature. We may think we can transform it to our ends and like keep it under control, but that's always a fool's errand. And we talk through the book about many examples of, of where this fails and why it fails. It's just because natural systems are extremely complicated. Um, they are, uh, they all, they have these feedbacks and all these complicating features that the more you press on them, the more things weird, weird things happen. Um, we use the example of the ozone hole in the book, um, uh, arguing that, um, uh, no one thought that the ozone hole would happen because we had replaced these refrigerants with something that was not supposed to react at all. All of our models suggested that these were super tightly bound molecules. But under the conditions in the stratosphere in Antarctic winter, those molecules broke apart and destroyed the ozone layer. And we're just lucky that it happened to be the right rate constant, so that it only happened under very cold conditions. If we were unlucky, then you know the whole ozone layer could have taken a hit. And that's just one of these like rare this this thing that just happens. Um, so we want to constrain that. And so that's where we kind of come against this Prometheanism, and and we argue that. Troy was saying this earlier that like this sort of self-criticism aspect of the book, um, that that aspect of, of Marxism, that aspect, aspect of that tradition uh, needs to be seriously confronted in the age of the environmental crisis. Um, uh, and we need to take it seriously as a, as a real problem. Um, so that's, uh, and so this, uh, I guess maybe what you, you described as possibly eco-austerity, um, uh, uh, we we make the case that it would not be an austere world even if it was materially less intense than the world we live in now because it's not like uh the lifestyles that we're currently living in the global north are making us very happy um it's uh, it's one of the main arguments for socialism is that this sort of new social system is offers freedom right offers freedom from uh, many of the aspects of capitalism that make us the most miserable and and that, you know, all these other kind of positive aspects uh, of life um, are really valuable. And so we make we try and make a positive case for why this is not austerity. It's it's merely um, it's worth the trade off. I don't know if Troy. Yeah, has yeah I mean, there. I would disagree with you, Drew. On this. I mean, I would say if, if anything, I, th I think you sound like a very degrowth um, kind of kind of, uh, uh, you know, articulating a degrowth position right now, because I think it's important to say that you know for some people having a you know we can tell them like you know you'll be just as happy making you know whatever it is having living standards of seventy thousand dollars a year versus seven hundred thousand dollars a year like just trust us you know like that money doesn't make you happy but rich people don't find those <laughs> arguments convincing so i mean um i think it's it's okay to say there's going to be conflict it's okay to say that we're going to disagree it's okay to say also i think for people who live you know, a very environmentally destructive life where they eat meat every day and they have like a big SUV and they have like three homes and they fly all the time. Do they really think how they're living, you know, makes sense? I mean, do, do, what do, I mean, they're doing it because they can get away with it. But I think, you know, they can't, I think they can't think, well, everyone can live like this. Or if you, if you think everyone can't live that way, then why are you allowed to live that way? So I think with, with, what we're trying to say, or no, but they would say, you know, if I restrict my cons uh, consumption, who cares? So it doesn't affect anything. And that's why socialism has to be about collectively deciding our living standards. And that's where we differ from these, these Promethean, you know, left, because they want to avoid conflict, which I find very bizarre, because they're quite, they're hypercritical of capitalism. They will say, you know, all these things are wrong. Here's the enemy, is the class enemy, and all that. But once you have socialism, suddenly it's suddenly it's like a dreamland, and everyone will get along, and we will cooperate. It's just not realistic. I mean, um, I think if, if the left is serious about taking power, it will have to have serious discussions about what will that society look like, and realize some people might not like it, and it's quite. It, it comes down to persuasion and coalition building and uh, I think from the point of view of you know maybe some 
upper middle class people in the global north, they might not like it, but that's a small minority of humanity as, as a whole. And I mean, and why should the rest of humanity pay for that? And that it should be okay to say they can lower their living standards. And um, and that's why we need to have these, these total plans that have real debates, because right now it's just uh, individualist kind of criticism, um, but it's not, it's, not, it's not enough, I think. Yeah, thanks both. Um, I mean, I, I'm compelled to keep this discussion on, the, on like following this train, but I, I'm wary that we're already at 40 minutes and I haven't talked about or given you guys the chance to talk about one of the really, really interesting aspects of the book, which is its form, um, its, its style. I mean, you know, of all the kind of verso nonfiction um, that's been published in the past few years. This is one of the most uh, genre bending of books, um, insofar as um, you both mix a kind of numerous uh, discourses and registers. You know, the book operates at this kind of academic um, style with 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 you know a plethora of endnotes, and yet at the same time, um, there is an opening chapter which is a kind of um, history of the future. Um, and then you end with a rewriting of William Morris's News from Nowhere um, to kind of give us a, a, you know, really a work of fiction, mm -hmm. a fictional account of um, one man who wakes up in 2047 and is kind of involved in a half of socialist project at a local level. So you have these different styles going on. And I note too that the book um, says that there is a video game which might be available already um, or is coming out and you guys provide the URL to that video game in the book and I'm sure it can be posted um, in the chat too. So you are experimenting throughout with different modes of engaging people on the question of scientific utopianism or even scientific socialism. And I think I wanted to kind of start by asking, you know, this imaginative, creative um, outlook and um, style that informs the book? Like, where does that come from for you? And why did you think that it was an important or opportune way of communicating the ideas that are integral to half of socialism? I'll start real quick. And then, I mean, I wanna say that when, when I met Drew, it's because he first read, you know, he read my essay, which uh, influences this book, but there was another essay about academic sexism and that I wrote uh, at that time. And I talk about, sex, you know, how the university system is full of sexism and it's really unfair for women and there's very few women who make full professor and there's lots of reasons why. And people don't like talking about sexism, but what I did as a rhetorical strategy was just draw on a ton of evidence and just like cite the crap out of, you know, this problem. And that was used as a rhetorical device. And we tried to do something similar in this book, right? I mean, we just back up everything. We try to make it as concrete as possible. Because what we're arguing is, you know, crazy. I mean, like, there's no, yeah, there's not like an army of vegan Marxists who are going to storm the Winter Palace tomorrow. I mean, like, this, this is something that is coming out of nowhere, but we think we can make a good case for it nonetheless, right? Um, so that's that's part of it. In terms of like the academic style, and we, we were talking about this before this conversation started uh, to be recorded, but I think the actual problems themselves forced us to write a certain way. It wasn't done consciously. So um, because we were writing about utopian socialism, we were pulled in all these weird directions. And, you know, like, again, I'm a historian and Andrew's a scientist, but then we were pushed into philosophy, into fiction, uh, into literature. And uh, that's just, I think, what comes with the territory of, of utopian uh, thought. And th in that way, we were inspired by the real lodestar of the book, who's Neurath, Otto Neurath. And he is just one of these polymaths who just does everything. But, uh, you know, he does graphic design, he does gardening, he does, you know, he's a war planner, he's a, uh, a you know, a historian and philosopher and, and all that, uh, and a revolutionary and a curator. I can go on. He did lots of things, but they were all connected in a way, they all added up to a project of, of socialism. And I think if you are thinking seriously about how to 
change the society that you live in, then you're going to be pulled in all these directions. And and that's way in this way, I think like this really opens up a hopefully a, a broader discussion. Uh, because instead of socialists saying we have to have a taboo and saying what socialism is and we can't talk about it, right? Uh, if you say, okay, what is socialism? Then we can, we can, yeah, we can talk about literature. We can talk about how we live. We can talk about uh, the futures we want. And I, I, I it's, it's. Uh, I think it's because of the genre itself. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to that by talking a little bit about maybe some of the utopians we, we draw on. Um, uh, we are big fans of William Morris, uh, who um, I think uh, is a precursor in some way because he um, uh, he's he's a real eco-socialist sort of before that's a term. Um, William Morris was a um, 19th century uh, uh, English uh, socialist who uh, wrote News from Nowhere, which is sort of a, it's it's a response to Edward Bellamy's uh, um, uh, uh, looking backwards, which is a, a fictional account of a socialist utopia that's somewhat folky, somewhat accelerationist uh, looking. Um, and uh, Morris responds with this this novel of like a, a rewilded Britain um, that's very beautiful uh, ornamentation. He, he describes the ornamentation in detail. Um, he describes salmon swimming up the Thames, um, all these uh, these descriptions. And, and uh, but um, Morris does this while also being very uh, very Marxist. He's very, he's not like a, there's a, often this contrast between utopian socialists and Marxists. Um, but, uh, but he did both. He's, he's someone who thinks a lot about, um, yeah, the conflict and all, all these other issues while still kind of positing a positive vision that can make us excited about the future and, and imagine what post-capitalism could be like. Um, and we think that that practice is really important. Um, uh, having a vision, like having this fictional story, um uh combined with you know dialogue with other thought and combined with um some of this this marxist tradition of critiquing capitalism this very kind of uh uh direct way and then uh, yeah adding in this new rat so it's i guess we kind of sprinkle in things kind of as necessary to address the problem that we had at um hand uh one style that we also we you, we talked a little bit about the somewhat academic style of the book. We try and keep it really fun, but we do have a lot of information in there. And we we have this style that I think assumes that the reader can keep up. Um, and so we we don't write we're using any terms that we think are not necessary and we define everything. It should be accessible to anyone. Uh, we worked hard on that, but we also don't like sit and draw out things for a long time, we kind of keep moving. Um, and I think that's important for this sort of scale of the problem that we're dealing with. Um, the fact that we want to write a short book um, so that it's more accessible. And um, yeah, and just because we think that, yeah, we need to have these conversations and that people can get involved. Yeah, Troy, we're going to say, yeah, say one thing that it's important to mention as well is that um, we also wrote the book out of a sense of frustration where people weren't saying, you know, how to actually you know, create a new society. And we wanted to kind of really work it out for ourselves. Uh, what would it, the question is, like, what is an ecologically stable society? What does it look like? Like, how much energy can we use? How much, you know, food do we need? How much land and all this stuff? And the third chapter is all, is, you know, it's written by Drew and it's all about, uh, uh, it's really like a voyage through uh, planning theory over the 20th century and up to the 21st century. And, um, and we think seriously about uh, how to make an economy without markets, uh, instead of just, I think, uh, you know, being unclear about that. We're, we want to be as clear uh, as possible. And I'll say just one last little thing about the Promethean comment before, where, uh, you know, I think that the, a lot of the left is Promethean. If you want to read some, you know, you can read some Trotsky or, you know, they, they all will say things about moving mountains or melting Arctic ice and, and so forth. And, uh, the Soviet Union, actually the idea of geoengineering came from the Soviet Union in the 70s, which is nuts. But um, I would say, and I, the, we have a lot of problems with uh, the uh, accelerationists now, but I wanted to say something nice about Aaron Bastani, where he recognizes the importance of having people stop eating meat. He's really into lab meat and he's into renewables and he's into rewilding as well. So he's uh, he's a nice exception to it, but most, most of the left is not like that. Okay, good, good uh, clarification. Um, 
We have uh, some audience questions piling in, um, so I'll kind oh, wow. of um, read through them. Um, I think maybe maybe one to maybe one which would be nice to kick off is a question that I think has come in from Twitter, uh, where someone has asked, "Is there not a contradiction between um, your big plan and the concept of socialist democracy?" So, I assume they're getting that there is um the the kind of uh idea that socialist democracy ought to be organized from below right and the concept of a big plan might be imposed from top down so there i, I think ident identifying um some gap right uh in the articulation of the hypothesis so how would you respond to those sorts of critiques um about a kind of top down vision that has to be imposed from above yeah, so we get into this a little bit in the third chapter of the book, um, or, or a good bit in the third chapter of the book. So we, we imagine sort of a two-tiered structure where there is sort of a broad kind of global conversation about these sorts of planetary boundaries is the scientific language for it. Like, um, you know, what sort of uh, uh, basically material footprint do we need to have on nature and how can we control that in such a way that we, we don't let out these monsters of uh, crises, environmental crises. But of course, that debate is not end all be all. Um, scientists can argue about it, and we can also decide based on our values uh, what sort of material footprint we need. And that kind of sets sort of this kind of course, uh, you know, course plan for the globe uh, that would be decided together. Now, how that plan is implemented could be can be decentralized um, and centered on local places as much as is as is possible. And that can be quite a good bit. So globally, we come up to, with these course ideas, um, some general ideas on maybe where food should be coming from, but like very broad. And then kind of at local, uh, regional and local levels, how that plan then gets implemented can be decided, um, you know, based on some representative system or uh, uh, workplace democracy combinations of those. Um, we don't stress uh, in detail the governance of this. It's not something we've thought about um, as much as uh, we'd like to. It's something we're thinking about now. But that's sort of the two-tiered level. It's sort of this, the environmental crisis demands global thinking, demands global governance in some sense, but that governance does not need to be top-down dictatorial. There's sort of this, this dialogue going on here. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't get away, that we we do need to be constrained by these global things. Like we, it can't be that I in one little region of the world can consume a massive amount of stuff um, and that has a material footprint elsewhere, consequences for other people. That, that there has to be some sort of coherence, right? That's sort of what we argue for, um, a middle path to some degree. Yeah, I mean, I think this is where I, I wonder, you know, we still have a residual attachment to liberal freedoms of like freedom on the marketplace and that is a certain kind of freedom but that's also exactly that freedom that got us into this mess right if everyone is there, if no one is constrained by how they act on the market then people will keep buying bigger cars and, and so forth so i mean i think there's because again I, 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 many omnivore you know, socialists will tell you you know well, veganism is an individualist choice and it's bourgeois and all that and then the response should be yeah it should be politicized and then, you know, maybe made mandatory, right? I mean, there's a, uh, and I think people are afraid of these discussions. And I think socialism, I mean, if you really think socialism is democratizing the economy, then it shouldn't be surprising that things will get political, right? And I think people are a bit scared of that. But it's funny where people are comfortable with saying, oh, we have to get rid of fossil fuels and we will you know, force companies and you know people to get rid of fossil fuels. But when you say, well, there's always other things that we have to worry about as well, then they, they, people get uncomfortable. So I think, you know, I'm not saying, I mean, I'm not trying to make an appeal for some kind of, you know, tanky tyranny of some sort. I'm saying uh, we need to de de decide how to consciously govern ourselves and govern our interchange with nature. And that's what we need to do. And as Drew's saying, we need to have some baseline set at a global level. And Neurat was all about, you know, you need some degree of centralization, right? You can't have just totally autonomous little, the little regional, you know, plans and no, no central plan. And then once you have those course guidelines, you figure out on a regional, local levels how best to implement them, right? With some flexibility. And again, in the book, we, we 
uh, go into, and Drew does amazing stuff about the history of uh, optimization and command theory and how we can set uh, kind of is Nyraxian total plans using linear programming and other tools, and then use cybernetics to have uh, more fine-tuned uh, plans that will link up at different levels. Great, thank you. Um, we have time for a couple more questions, and I've got one here ready to go. Um, this is a, another question from Twitter. Maybe this is this is this calls for a quick response um, from one of you, so that we can keep it going um, in the next five. So we've got about five, six, seven minutes left. Um, someone, someone's asked, does not John Bellamy Foster talk about how Marx identified a metabolic rift um, in which human, uh, sorry, humanity is separated from nature by the imposition of enclosure, the capitalist system? Um, and this idea seems to be counter to luxury communism, they've, they've said. Now, my, my, my assumption, having read the book, is that whilst you um, are kind of in agreement with certain facets of John Bellamy Foster's reading of Marx and the kind of greening of Marxism. I get the sense that you're also skeptical of um, certain ideas of that kind of green Marxism. So I wonder if you can quickly come in on that and how, you know, it might be that you share Bellamy Foster's um, like um, mm. kind of stance against the kind of luxury communism, but you might also have your own um, differentiation from that that strand of Marxist thought. Has he written anything about folk or accelerationist stuff? I, I wonder. I, I'm not sure if he directly engages with it, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm a good eco-socialist. I've read my Foster. Um, some of you know, some of it's great, and of course, he kind of built the field up in the '90s, and you have to give him credit for that. Uh, to me. I, I agree with the metabolic rift and the, the, that idea. To me, I'm not sure if it's like a concept that's like big enough in a way to build a whole field, right? I think it's like a useful insight, but um, I don't think it's a foundation, right? And what we tried to do in the book instead is actually use the humanization of nature. And that's kind of our, our main concept. And when we think that's a very useful concept um, if you're thinking about yeah environmental planning, but also if you want to deal with the Promethean problem uh, and, and, and Marx, uh, it also is useful if you want to argue with Latourians who would say, oh, no, we're all hybrids and all that. And I think it does a lot of more work for us, and we use it uh, a lot more. Um, my only real critique of Foster is that I think he's not hard enough on Marx. I think he wants to say, you know, Marx thought of all this stuff beforehand and He's, he's a real green guy. I think if you read a lot of Marx, you see a lot of Prometheanism. I mean, he liked Prometheus. I mean, um, and I think if we, and again, I'm a Marxist. I think Marx is amazing. But you, we have to be like the neoliberals where we shouldn't be shy of criticizing the foundations of our philosophy and dealing with the founders you know, of our movement. Uh, obviously, like the neoliberals have a weird relationship to Adam Smith, where they like him, but also say that he's wrong. You know, and I think with with Marx, um, with the humanization of nature idea, we really get into the Promethean core and say, and then kind of rip it out, right? And we say uh, the humanization of nature is impossible because you're acting, or as in the total humanization of nature is impossible and dangerous. It shouldn't even be tried because it will lead to these un predictable catastrophes such as uh, you know, pandemics and all that. So therefore, Marxism and socialism has to be constrained. So this is what we're trying to do. We don't think uh, Foster really gets into a real engagement with that problem. He just ignores it. Yeah, cheers for that. I mean, I think that if I was to kind of offer a reflection on the book based on what you said, I mean, it, seem, it seems if one of, one of the things that the book is doing very, very well and very thoroughly is to take up what's useful from thinkers and discard what isn't, um, and not to judge um, ideas based on who said them, um, but to take up what is what is immediately useful um, for the project at hand. And so, you know, it's not that it's not that the baby is thrown out with the bathwater 
and uh, just because there's a Promethean strain in Marxist thought and, and that's it. No, it's that this is a Marxist project. It's just that there are there are these particular aspects which need to be worked through. And it's the same with the engagement with uh, Otto Neurath, with, with neoliberal thought, with the planning of the neo neoliberal thought, even with half earth as a concept, right? You know, there are, there are kind of the, the communist agroecology critiques of veganism and half earth, which would be like saying, this is a, you know, a, a colonial project just without uttering the word. Um, it would recapitulate the problems of the conservation movement. It would lead to wholesale indigenous displacement. But, it, but the book has answers um, to those questions. And then this, the same, um, the same with, the, with, with socialist thought too. Um, but on the, on the specific side of the, the kind of um, land use uh, of, of, of agriculture and the half of, we had, we had a question on YouTube um from oliver white and this is a kind of series of a series of comments and questions which i'm sure both of you have seen in the chat as mm. we've been speaking but basically what it comes down to there is is it a kind of um propaganda um that that landscapes are kind of conceived as being only um for for cattle or, or for, for livestock um is land for pasture is it is something that's justified by the state and and why is it pushed as being incapable of growing other things right so it's a political question rather than just a kind of um, ecological one um so oliver oliver concludes like how would you counter this argument it, it's a fallacy right uh, that's what he said so maybe you can respond to that um drew yeah i think one of the things we talk about in the book is how um uh, we have a, some some section there about all these uh, ecosystems and their ability to kind of absorb carbon based on their functioning well. So I think a lot of people think, you know, you plant trees, the trees take up carbon. Uh, but in reality, the vast majority of carbon in the land system is stored in the soil, like orders of magnitude more than in the stuff on top. Um, so uh, the ecosystem as a whole, including the bugs and stuff in the dirt and the uh, fungi and all the bacteria and all that stuff. That's part of the ecosystem. So um, things like the American Midwest used to have feet and feet of topsoil just storing tons and tons of carbon. So uh, you can make the argument that some of these areas are not um, able to grow anything else. Um, but one thing that they can do is uh, be healthy ecosystems, right? Healthy ecosystems that support biodiversity, that sequester carbon, that uh, function uh, in this way that is is inherently valuable. And then also, you know, Oliver points out, um, I think rightly that a lot of the places that are pasture land could easily grow other things. Like a lot of the Amazon has been deforested to make way for cattle range land. Um, uh, and I mean, ideally you would put that back in the Amazon, but obviously that land could be used for growing a lot of stuff, right? Um, so this is, yeah, it's it's a, it's a ridiculous argument, I think. Uh, um, yeah, I, I think know. it's really interesting real quick is that, um, again, people think that, you know, if we have a half earth and widow, there'll be too little land left, right? And again, if people aren't eating meat, we don't need very much land, right? Um, and Drew has some, you know, Drew devises linear program that we use in the book and trying to work out some problems. And he says, okay, if we don't use that many biofuels because we try to accelerate, you know, electrification and try to, uh, you know, lower energy use in different ways, um then uh, what was the exact number i mean like one of the models you had was you could rewild like 70 percent of the world and, and all yeah that. or more if you assume yeah. total electrification yeah so we don't need very much less i think this idea like oh this is marginal land it has to be used for for livestock i i think that's not a serious problem okay um unless there are any more questions it might be time to wind, wind it in i mean maybe to maybe to finish um i can read one of the epigraphs of the book um which is a uh, which is really great i mean i'll go with the ep thompson um quote here we enter utopia uh, sorry i'll start again we enter utopias proper and newfound space the education of desire this is not the same as a moral education towards a given end it is rather to open a way to aspiration, to teach desire to desire, to desire better, to desire more, and above all, to desire in a different way. Um, so the book's utopianism 
is about desiring in different ways than what we have now. So thank you, um, Troy and Drew, for imagining those new desires. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. 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 yeah th thank you, everyone, for that. Thank you, Dominic, for uh, seeing us through there, and Drew and Troy, for a very interesting discussion, I think, covering a, a wide range of things, which I'm sure will uh, provoke uh, questions and responses um, uh, in the future days, as this video will remain on YouTube and on our Facebook page uh, and so on. And we usually we get a lot of follow-up on the video. So maybe we, if there are questions and um, comments, we can try and forward them to you. Yeah, contact yeah. us, chat yeah. with us, yeah. Okay, and of course the last thing which I have to say is of course buy the book, which you can get uh, from Bookmarks and from any other independent uh, bookshop in your local area. Um, um, we actually do not have another um, online uh, uh, book launch planned uh, at the moment yet, um, but we will be appearing in a, the special Bookmarks tent at the Marxism Festival in Central, well, it's not in Central London anymore, in East London, um, uh, on the 1st to the 3rd of July. And, um the 1st of July is my birthday, so you can all come along and say hi to me then. So thank you again to our authors and to Dominic. And uh, good night, everybody, and um, buy the book. Bye.